technologies and theories, Dr. McMillian is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research bridges K-12 education and reform law, education policy, elementary and secondary educational governance, special education law, and sociology. She's worked in public schools for more than 10 years and currently contracts with Columbus City Schools as a school psychologist. She also served at the university level for close to five years as the Associate Director of K-12 Access Programming and Engagement in the Division of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity at the University of Missouri. Um, and I think we're going to hold our questions until the end. So if you have questions, um, stick them in the chat or uh, go ahead and ask them at the end. Thank you for asking questions. All right. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Um, spring is finally here, right? And so outside is beautiful. And I don't know if you're like me, I get spring fever really bad. <laughs> so even now, I wish like this presentation was like outside somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, but no, seriously, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for extending an invitation for me to be here. Thank you, Alan, for facilitating the details of today. And just like Katie said, um, I'm assistant professor. This is my second semester as an assistant professor. And I spent the past two years as a postdoc here. I'm really excited about being a Buckeye, my third year as a Buckeye. And um, OSU and Columbus, Ohio has been um, good to me and good for me. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, today's topic is uh, a constitutional right to education, uh, K through 12 educational jurisprudence amongst the United States Circuit Courts. Um, I saw a news um, article uh, about a year ago about a case out of Michigan, and I was really, really inspired by the issues presented in that case. And I literally wrote a grant proposal within a week to really study this issue, submitted it, and uh, it got funded. <laughs> <laughs> You all are very, very lucky because it's just been under a year that I received this grant. And I am going to just be sharing just some preliminary ideas, some things that are bubbling up in the cases, and um, some things that I think that, some directions I think I'm gonna go um, in terms of my research. So I'm really, really excited to be sharing this with you today. Let's see. All right, perfect. This is our agenda for the next 30 to 40 minutes. And I'm hoping that um, we can get through this smoothly. And, uh, but I did think that uh, as we transition into our main course, I do believe that's important to share just a little bit of my research framing and how I approach policy analysis with a qualitative lens. Um, I tend to describe myself as an interdisciplinary education policy scholar. Um, I subscribe to Marilyn uh, Stember's 1990 definition, where she defines interdisciplinary as integrating knowledge and methods from various disciplines and combining that knowledge or methods to create a theoretical framework. So using critical um, qualitative methods such as critical discourse analysis and critical policy analysis, uh, and critical theories of race, such as racial realism, critical legal studies. I integrate knowledge from education policy and education reform law to one, understand how K-12 education policy and law really influence the educational experiences of our elementary, middle, and high school students um, and how that forms this type of education governance. And two, how education policy and reform law impacts African-American students and students with disabilities and as Katie said earlier, I am a school psychologist, and I think that um, our students with disabilities are a part of our very special and vulnerable population, and I think that we should do all that we can to, um, to be uh, good gatekeepers of their educational experiences, and that's why I still practice as a school psychologist today. So I take an interdisciplinary approach because I believe that public education is influenced by networking social systems and what I call it in my dissertation, um, such as like the court system, urban development, justification, and the economy, and examining phenomena and public education through an interdisciplinary lens really creates for us this nuanced and comprehensive view as well as a collaborative approach to solutions. 
So with this, my approach to policy analysis is one, again, that is interdisciplinary. And though we know um, essentially that our country's constitution does not explicitly guarantee a right to education, um, it should not restrict us in this room and those joining us on Zoom from scholarly um, inquiry that could lead our country into a path that would eventually secure that right. You never know. We might be here in 30 years from now, 20, 30 years, you never know. So as we explore together the cases that have significantly impacted education policy and also shifted our sociocultural practices, I think I would be remiss if I did not mention Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, and San Antonio uh, Independent School District versus Barriga in 1972. And of course, there are other landmark cases but I, I pin these two cases together because they are two sides of the same coin. And so Brown obviously is one of the most significant rulings in our nation's history because it overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and established that separate schools and facilities were inherently unequal and that separate but equal violated the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. And as the decision came forth, uh, obviously, both segregationists and legal scholars were not initially very supportive of the decision. Segregationists, obviously, because it, uh, to them, adversely impacted their way of life. And legal scholars, because they actually believe that qualitative data presented by the social scientists in that case um, before the court actually went against precedent or legal tradition. And that was um, um, archives.gov has a really good um, article on their website about the differences um, in opinion when that decision came out. And so in San Antonio ISD versus Rodriguez, the district sued the state on behalf of its students. Like most public schools, um, San Antonio at the time was partially funded by local property taxes. And the plaintiffs argued that because property taxes were in low, um, were in low property areas that students and their education was being under resourced and underfunded when compared to more wealthier districts, excuse me. So they argued that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, right, uh, mandated uh, the same argument um, in Brown, mandated equal funding among school districts. But the Supreme Court held that there was not a fundamental right to education guaranteed by the Constitution and that the Equal Protection Clause did not require exact uh, equality or precisely equal advantages. And so again, I chose these two cases because what they do is they paint a perfect picture of how the same law, legal principles, and policy uh, can be argued and applied to education, yet render different rulings and uh, eventually different outcomes for students. So even as we consider the rulings of these two cases, there is like this familial contention, right? You know, family, siblings, uh, contention between um, that exists. And, and what it suggests is that uh, we can, on one side, concede that, uh, concede to the importance of access to an education or agree that the Constitution affords some educational provisions. But yet, at the same time, we cannot say explicitly um, or unanimously agree that education is, in fact, a fundamental right protected by the United States Constitution. So fast forwarding to 2018, um, our first case up is Gary B. v. Uh, Whitmer. It was a, initially named Gary B. versus Snyder. Um, Governor Gretchen Whitmer inherited this case um, when she assumed um, her position as governor of Michigan. So this case is probably one of the most popular of the three cases. In 2018, students and former students from Detroit Public Schools, what they did was they sued several Michigan state officials, alleging that the conditions, um, that conditions around teaching facilities and materials of their school were so poor and so inadequate that they did not or were not receiving a minimally edu uh, adequate education because, again, the plaintiffs in this case were former students and current students at the time. So their initial suit was both dismissed and affirmed in part, and the court believed that they made an inadequate attempt to plead their equal protection and um, compulsory attendance claims. However, the court did affirm their central claim, which was that they had been denied a basic minimal education 
and thus having been dep deprived of access to the literacy, which was really, really huge. And shout out to attorney, I think Carter Phillips. He was the lead counsel and he's a Buckeye. <laughs> O-H. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So kudos to him. And um, the facts of this case centered on teaching facilities and materials. So plaintiffs were uh, uh, students at Detroit Public Schools that served almost exclusively low income um, and students of color. So within the area of teaching, the schools substantially lack qualified teaching staff. Um, that is teachers who were certified properly, uh, teachers who were uh, trained by the state, certified by the state and assigned to a class within their area of qualification and expertise. Now, schools also experience a substantial amount of teacher absences, and we even see that in COVID, there are still a lot of teacher absences. But in this particular case in Detroit, um, some teachers were absent as many as 50 days per school year, which is a lot. Uh, at one point, the case mentioned that there was an eighth grade student uh, placed in charge of teaching seventh grade and eighth grade math for a month because there was no math teacher available. Um, that student needs a scholarship because if <laughs> that intelligent to teach math on that level, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So obviously it's the adults, not the kids in this situation. So, um, so within the area of facilities, during the 2015-2016 school year, the city of Detroit admitted that none, not some, None of their school buildings, which was somewhere around 105, give or take, were up to code. None of their buildings were up to code. Not some, none. And by the time this lawsuit came about, some of the plaintiff schools um, were still not up to code. For example, classroom temperatures, according to um, data presented in the cases, they exceeded 90 degrees within uh, in both winter and summer months, and temperatures in the building could rarely be regulated so much so that schools often closed for the day or dismissed early. Um, additionally, the extreme heat and cold affected the health of students and teachers, and they saw like a, a, a outbreak in rashes, heat rashes, and things of that nature. Mice, roaches, um, and other vermin were frequent inhabitants of these schools. Um, I read that teachers would have to come to school early to clean up the rodent feces um, before the students arrived. Uh, the hallways and the classrooms would smell of dead vermin and black mold. Um, the water in the buildings were contaminated and therefore undrinkable. The toilets did not were inoperable. The bathroom stall, um, in the bathroom, there were no doors on the stalls or toilet paper. And sometimes, uh, in the case, it said that the ceiling tiles and plaster will fall on teachers and students. So regarding materials, uh, students did not have appropriate textbooks. Um, they were uh, out of date, they were torn, um, beyond repair, and some were unreadable. And in many cases, there were so few copies of textbooks that students had to share a single book among four or more students during class. And quite naturally, if we're having this issue with textbooks, we already know what may uh, what we can make of their school libraries, right? So the libraries were inaccessible or had uh, very few books available. So that's here in America, uh, 2000. Uh, 18, 19, uh, pre-COVID. So we're putting all of this in context, right, with what our students are experiencing. So quite naturally, this was actually the case that inspired me to even um, to even study this issue. So if we fast forward to our next case, we have Reeves uh, B. Williams. Now I will admit that Reeves B. Williams is probably, to me, the most fascinating of them all because. Um, I'm not formally like, I'm not really good with history, but I love history. And I love learning about our past. And um, I'm particularly fond of the legal strategy taken in this case in Reeves um, versus William. Um, it's also known as the readmission uh, acts case. And I'm really, really excited about, uh oh, let's see, sorry about that. 
about learning more about this case. Um, this case is called the Readmission Act because the central claim of the plaintiffs was that the amendment to the education clause of the Mississippi State Constitution violated the school rights and privileges condition of the Mississippi's readmission into the Union after the Civil War. So the plaintiffs in this case was comparing the, an amended uh, Constitution 1987 to the original Constitution established when Mississippi was readmitted into the Union after the Civil War. So after the Civil War, uh, immediately after the Civil War, like kind of like right after, right before Reconstruction, like it's like a two-year phase. Uh, as a condition of readmission and congressional representation, Congress imposed stipulations for education upon the remaining Confederate states, Virginia, Texas, and Mississippi. Now, in the legislation appearing here at the bottom of your screen, legislation stated that the Constitution shall never be amended or changed as to deprive any citizen or class of citizens of the United States of the school of the school rights and privileges secured by the Constitution of said state. So the issue in this case is that plaintiffs argue that the education clause of the Mississippi Constitution, section 201, 1987, um, that amendment violated the federal conditions of readmissions into the union. So to quote the case, they highlight one specific difference between the 1868 and 1987 education clauses. While the 1868 version of the education clause required the legislature to establish a uniform system of public, of free public schools, the 1987 version omitted uniformity and mandated only that, legis that the Mississippi legislature would provide for the establishment of a system of free public schools. Now, the plaintiffs allege that the removal of the uniformity clause caused significant disparities, as you can imagine in the educational resources, as well as opportunities, and of course, the outcomes um, uh, to the Mississippi children, particularly those who were African-American. But um, uh, similar to Gary B, the plaintiffs of this case were majority African-American students. The school facilities also were physically inadequate. Again, the teachers uh, teaching these students were not credentialed and they were inexperienced. They were not uh, veteran teachers, the ones that they did have. And um, I thought it was really interesting that this case mentioned the opportunities to participate in extracurricular activities were limited. I thought that was really interesting. And I, I can't wait to um, unpack that because you would think that if students had nothing else that they would have you know, extracurricular activities, right? Band, um, sports, and things of that nature. And so um, this was one of their claims. And according to the plaintiffs, uh, Mississippi removal of the word uniform from its constitution resulted in a violation, again, of the Readmission Act. And it caused harm, um, a number of harms, um, including illiteracy, a diminished likelihood of high school graduation, uh, low rates of college attendance and acceptance, college completion, as well as an increase in likelihood of future poverty. And so that was uh, the Mississippi case. I think that was the fifth district. And lastly, we have our uh, could be Remindo, um, or now McKee, because there's also a new governor there in, um, in Rhode Island. And I believe this case is currently in appeal process. That's why I still have a dash there. And these are actual students um, from the Rhode Island case. And so that's a that's a legitimate picture there. And so this is our last case. In November 2018, students and former students of Rhode Island Public Schools sued then governor, Gina Romano, alleging that their schools failed to provide them an adequate civics education. Now, I thought it was interesting, this case, unlike the others, did not explicitly mention the race of students, but we can obviously see, however, that, um, that we do know that it is, it is, they're, they're mostly students of color and it's still very racially diverse, which is good. Um, this group of students is, however, led by a young African-American woman by the name of um, Athea Cook. And so that's what the initials stand for. 
And she believed that their access to civic education was inadequate when compared to more affluent schools. And so comparing themselves to more affluent schools, we can probably um, you know, assume that these students were middle to lower class students. Um, also, uh, New York Times did a fascinating article on um, the lead plaintiff of this case. If you get a chance, please Google that. Um, I thought it was a great profile. And um, it really lends its ear to where we are in terms of um, uh, developing posterity uh, to preserve our democracy. Uh, this case, um, this lawsuit asked the court to confirm, to affirm rather, that public school students are entitled to an education that not only prepares them for college, but also prepares them to exercise their constitutional rights, including voting, exercising their free speech, petitioning the government, and actively engaging in civic life. So their, came, their claims the students highlighted was that Rhode Island did not require civic courses at the time, um, they did not mandate testing for civic knowledge, and that their curriculum uh, tended, um, excuse me, tended to focus on STEM related content. And we know um, the engine or the machine behind STEM education. The civics curriculum uh, Rhode Island did uh, adopt was not implemented uh, fully. So it was partially implemented. And the courses did not promote discussion of controversial issues such as enslavement. Um, Rhode Island failed to update uh, materials. They did not train their educators. They did not provide various opportunities for a civic experiences, such like student council. Everybody, you know, that's usually a norm. And, uh, but these students were not exposed to those opportunities, which is surprising. Um, the student newspaper, um, either in some schools did not exist or was very limited, um, as well as field trips to like the state capitol or Washington, D.C., some of those trips that we're all, that most of us probably have been on at some point. And so um, I would like to make a note that, um, that during the pendency of the appeal most recently, that the legislature in Rhode Island did amend the Rhode Island law that would require civics proficiency. Um, it required uh, civics proficiency. It required public schools to provide a civics education as a part of history and social studies curriculum. And at least one student led civics project during a student's middle or high school beginning in the year 22, 2023. So starting this fall. So that is, you know, a good thing. Um, the this case was, uh, this case was really, really, uh, relevant because of where we are now with uh, teaching about the, the actual history, the actual American history, and not uh, removing or sanitizing our history. And so this case is particularly relevant. And if you all get a chance, um, the, the lead counsel, his name is, uh, last name is Rebel. Um, the opinion that came from the court was beautifully, beautifully written. And actually, I think that uh, I sat in on a workshop with the judge um, and the, <laughs> and the uh, lead attorney, and they kind of bounced around it. They couldn't really talk so, so much about the case, but the judge did mention, he said that our democracy is in peril. And he writes about that if you pull up the opinion. And it was really, um, and I think he was writing the opinion during the time of January 6th. And so he even mentioned the issue, the insurrection around January 6th in his opinion. And I think it's um, particularly telling of where we are. So these cases, these cases are not disconnected, right? This is one thing that I'm, I'm finding out. Um, that initially when I approached it, I thought that maybe these were, I thought maybe the Rhode Island case was going to be one of its own. And then maybe Mississippi and Michigan were going to be, you know, more alive. But really when I got to looking at um, this, the connection between the three cases, there's just this strong sense of citizenship and democracy. And we've always had this conversation here in America about what it means to be a patriot. Right? What it means to be an American? What is a real American? And oftentimes, um, when we're talking about that, is usually uh, African Americans are usually not in the conversation. 
Um, we had a president who's African American who they spent a considerable amount of time um, even trying to just get a copy of his birth certificate and not believing that he was an American. And so this whole notion or this narrative of what is an American or being an American citizen is inextricably linked to um, our democracy. And I see that um, while Rhode Island didn't have an issue with their school building, they didn't have an issue with their teachers, it was the curriculum. And so I, I guess the basic needs or the basic necessities of education was provided for them. They were on the next level that probably Mississippi and Michigan would need, right? And so right now, Michigan and Mississippi are like, listen, we just, we just wanna, you know, a building that we can be safe in at this point. And we're in Rhode Island, like, you know, listen, we're not here yet. We're not learning these very important issues that um, really impact our, our education and really influence the way we engage as citizens um, when we become of age to, um, to vote. And quite naturally, many of them probably already paying taxes because they might have a little part-time job or whatever. So there are many of them may already be taxpayers. So these cases are not disconnected. And so taken together, these cases lay bare some of the severe challenges that I believe continue to cripple our American public education system and American democracy. So these cases remind us that even though the Supreme Court is quiet on affirming the fundamental right to education, there are fewer lower courts willing to make that leap towards a path of progress. And if you read the opinions of um, the judges, um, you can tell that, um, that there may be no, um, no, no positive uh, recourse in terms of the legal strategy, but there is a need to affirm um, students' right to an education in some way or form. And so maybe that might be remanded to the lower courts to do, and obviously a task for not only just state legislatures, but state education agencies, and also us researchers, um, that is something that we should, um, that we should help to provide. And so while these cases may not have ended in absolute victory, they do, however, bring attention to the cleavages in public education that are so apparently disparate. And students are forced to use the law as leverage, as leverage to receive just the right. And so again, they lost, many of them, but there are some wins. There are some wins, rather. One of the first thoughts that I had that come to mind is that um, I'm from the South and I am from a traditional faith um, background. And so I was telling my students when we're talking about policy, uh, America is so polarized to now we, I feel that we're circumventing conversations around the morality and the ethics of our American democracy. And that we're really, we're really treading into a different jurisdiction, which is really the heart of men and our intention to create a fun and more perfect union. And so with that, I, I, I was reading and I thought, you know, America is not well. And I remember um, that the Lord Patton Davis, she's the um, department chair at studies over the college of education and human ecology. And she recently gave the AERA Brown lecture recently, and she paralleled the COVID-19 pandemic with the state of education and essentially how our work are forms of, thank you, are forms of vaccines. And uh, reading the details of these cases reminds me that though there are tangible moments of racial progress in education, and, um, and the vaccine is working for some. Others are still testing positive and are still in debilitating conditions. And I think these cases highlight that we're still not well as Americans and that there's still some deep reckoning that we have to do in reconciliation. And when I say reconciliation, that comes in the form of education policy reform that authenticity, that authentic, authentically closes equitable gaps. So we need systemic equitable funding formulas, right? And we've been saying that the research is out there, right? And um, we need it because we need it to provide quality teaching, safe buildings, 
and diverse and rigorous curriculum uh, to all American students. And that's just the first tier approach. We can't even get that. We have years, we have decades of research saying that our education funding formulas are inequitable and that states have yet to fully, you know, um, commit to funding um, education or they're cutting budgets. Um, COVID, they have, you know, added some more money to the budget, whether on the federal level or the state level, but it's still not, um, the funding formula is still not equitable. And we have, again, decades of research that says that. And so if we have decades of research that just says that one thing will close some equity gaps, can we at least have that? <laughs> And so if we can't have that, again, that brings us to a really moral and ethical point in our democracy, right? And it, um, I think it's a national security risk because I think that we are destabilizing our democracy when we fail to strengthen the pillars of education. Um, another implication could be that um, what we take from these cases is that equity in our public education system really is a contingent upon um, a revision, an immediate revision of our constitution, but rather a commitment to the original wording of the state's constitutions, um, especially in the case of Mississippi. Had they not taken out that form, that word uniformity, and we all know, I believe that education clause by 1987 was the fourth time that their state, that the education clause had been amended. And so we know the cultural context and the social context of Mississippi. And so obviously that word uniformity um, had some uh, inference to equity or equality. And so removing such word will exacerbate uh, pre-existing um, inequities and again, um, stifle a particular populace of students. And I don't even think it's just um, African-American students. I think that when we look at our rural um, American public school system, if we were to look at Appalachian and West Virginia and rural Georgia, rural Ohio, rural, um, rural Missouri, I used to work in rural Missouri, and the conditions of their schools are still, you know, below standard in terms of um, Amer the American way. Um, let's see. I think that uh, these cases strategically lay bricks a path to securing equity within our public schools. Um, I think that the legal strategy of Brown was developed across multiple cases over the span of decades. And I do believe we're in a state of emergency. And the inequities presented in these cases existed prior to the onset of COVID. So we can only imagine that COVID exacerbated these cases, these issues rather. And so I do understand we're in a case, a case of emergency, um, but I think that forcing or having conversations about revising a constitution, our federal constitution, is probably not the most prudent course that we can take right now. I think that there are some other courses that we can take and we can discuss that. Um, that will probably get us there quicker than having constitutional debates um, about what needs to be done. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going through a lot of, when I say data, I'm, think, I'm, I'm using this data like my court documents, court transcripts, um, media outlet videos, uh, 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 newspaper articles, everything. Um, that's my form of data. And then I will uh, use that and I probably, set up an interview with maybe lead counsel trying to get some more insight. But for the most part, um, I love delving into court documents to see what the court saw. And um, we have a different lens than the court. And so what is something that we can use here? Um, I think that that's data that is very necessary as qualitative researchers. So two conceptualizing points that I would like to highlight is that one, I think that restricting one's access to education is, in fact, restricting one's right to citizenry. And again, it destabilizes democracy. Um, our children, if they live in North Dakota, South Dakota, Michigan, West Virginia, Mississippi, they're all Americans. 
right? And I think that if we want to continue in this spirit of the American dream, I think that the dream needs to be accessible to all students. And um, I think that if we come to a point in our society where we can see them um, as, American, as, as American citizens, that we will come to our more higher moral or ethical ground and hopefully be able to co-create equitable policy that reflects that newfound um, affirmation. Um, in, in 1866, I thought that it was really interesting. I was reading um, a book by Derek Black, and it's called Schoolhouse Burning. And um, there was a, a, a representative in, in 1866 out of New Hampshire. His name was Mace Mouton, and he argued in favor of a federal department of education. And he said something that I thought was really interesting. He said, the two great pillars of our American Republic upon which it rests are universal liberty and universal education. And it's really interesting how conceptually, these, this is essentially what these students are arguing in these cases, that their liberties are being infringed upon and that they want um, a universal approach to education to ensure, to ensure that they can participate fully as American citizens. And if we consider the time frame immediately after the Civil War, early reconstruction, Congress did make a real attempt at securing a more perfect union. And by extending the right to education to both Americans who were formerly enslaved and poor. And schooling is a very critical pillar of citizenship. And as I read and cross cold data from these cases, education is a pillar of our democracy and it's a salient theme throughout all of these cases, which affirms the essence of Mouton's argument that our American Republic rests upon the universal liberty and universal education. And the last one is that racism and classism are essentially injunctions against America's fullest potential. I had the opportunity of speaking with the lead counsel, Gary B. Phillips, and um, I asked him, I said, you and I both know, we all know in this room that race is a central factor in uh, particularly Mississippi and Michigan case. How do you devise a legal, a legal strategy that addresses race, but does not explicitly mention race? Because their approach to literacy was a very, very strategic strategy. And he said that he focused on students' right to literacy and how the right to literacy was violated. And then he focused on the scope of that violation. And the scope of that violation may or may not include specific demographics if you apply that rule to another case. Particularly in the Michigan and Mississippi cases, race is more apparent and schooling conditions are more egregious. It appears that the current state of education reform policy mirrors our partisan po our politics rather than an equitable democracy. And so the American way, I say, the American way is in America's way, right? Our history, this cyclical cycle of capitalism, racism, classism, gender, all the isms, like uh, the American way is in America's way. And there's a brief policy window that explicitly mentioned race and education as a condition for Confederate states readmission. And Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts proposed the language. He said to establish and sustain a system of public schools open to all without the distinction of race and color. He said that. And the problem with this language was during that time, he said that Congress had already passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 14th Amendment that provided race prohibitions. So Sumner appears felt that another racialized statute, right, would be redundant. Too much race, too much race, take race out of that. But he was trying to secure something. So slavery was in fact an injunction against America's fullest potential. And it seems that there were people that were there trying to remedy the issue. 
and men in Congress who, were, who made attempts to remedy the harms of slavery, you know, I applaud them, but there were few, they were outnumbered. Similar to what um, my ancestors wanted, they wanted freedom, literacy, the right to vote. It's really interesting how those same desires then are now the same desires as by the very students of these cases. And so um, the case these students are asking, not just the courts, but the students are also asking us um, to affirm their right to be fully American and to have access and opportunity and to have a right to education. Thank you. All right, questions? Before we jump ahead, so, um, do you want to end the screen share? That way you'll be able to see if anyone raises their hand on the Zoom or anything like that. Oh, yes, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. Question this one something earlier. Oh. Any questions online? No questions. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll start to stop if that's okay. Yes. Thank you so much for that that presentation. It was so thought provoking, and I love how you're taking a qualitative approach to looking at these policies and, and judgments. Um, so, as a qualitative person, I'm just really interested and fascinated to hear a little bit more about your empirical strategy and approach. Um, you mentioned toward the end all of the data you're collecting around these cases, and it's even broader than I would have expected beyond you know the court transcripts and into like the news and stuff. Wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you're planning on approaching all of the data because you mentioned um, critical discourse analysis mm -hmm. originally, and it just seems like there's some really interesting opportunities with that analysis to um, further demonstrate the types of points you're making about the conflicts that we have in our discourse in terms of we believe in equality, but we're not providing equal education. And in terms of how race does or doesn't show up in this conversation. And then also, um, one of the things that kind of occurred to me as you were talking was just what constitutes a legitimate argument in relation to education and what doesn't. Um, and kind of maybe some of those absences are just as important as what's included in the conversation. Right, that's really good. So, your first part. Um, in terms of my methodological approach, I really didn't talk a lot about that. Um, definitely, when I approach this data, I'm looking at uh, this framework is called a narrative political framework, and I'm merging that with critical discourse analysis. And so, um, quite naturally, the use of um, in, in literature, we have like this idea of narratology or narrative inquiry. And, um, and, and how it tells this story about what happens in society. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to have like an interpretive method that seeks to interpret meaning of the succession of events. And so that's why I'm looking at the narrative political framework because I want to um, explain what is occurring because if I were to take this presentation over to Morris, right, they probably know about these cases, right? They probably have had discussion and probably maybe even here in John Glenn. But if we were to take, you know, this information to AERA, right, or an education research um, conference, there's still a huge bit of people in our field, uh, a considerable amount of scholars, rather, in our field who are oblivious to what's happening here. And so I pulled this up because, of course, it's a lot to read. <laughs> but, but I didn't, but I didn't want uh, because I didn't mention uh, my framing for this study. And um, again, it's uh, and I'd be happy to share, you know, this with you in in, in a greater in a greater detail. But I'm using the narrative uh, political framework because I want to talk about the uh, succession of events and just. Um, and even now I'm writing a manuscript 
And I just want to talk about what these cases are and what happened. And then the next paper is going to be like, okay, so what does this mean? Um, uh, what is it implying? Um, and then not only that, what are some of these social cultural practices that are being shaped from these cases? Um, and so obviously uh, in the Whitmer case out of Michigan, the, uh, the, the, the case was um, settled, but the governor, you know, it's a new governor. And she said, you know, I inherited this issue. You know, I want to make amends. I want to make it right. And so, you know, that she's putting some policies in place in Michigan to try to redress some of those inequities. And I think that, uh, you know, those are things that we need to know. And um, I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that a critical discourse approach, looking at policies and practices and how they shape um, our society. And that's, that's kind of like my, I use Blair Fairclough a lot with critical discourse analysis. And I look at, you know, the text, the social practice, um, like this meso, uh, macro and, and, and micro um, approach to discourse. And not only what is it saying, but what is it not saying? And so, uh, and I think that I fell in love with using court uh, documents as data during my dissertation. I did uh, Smith versus Henderson out of DC, where they sued, uh, a grassroots organization sued DC public schools for closing schools. And um, all of them, it impacted 99% of um, African American students. And so I was privy to the depositions and the subpoena documents. And I went through those emails and um, compared how you had this hidden narrative, right? And, um, and how you have a public narrative that's framed, uh, a narrative that's framed for the public. So that political narrative framework is really useful because you know how we have a very uh, colloquial conversation, how you know that there was a meeting before the meeting. You know, <laughs> you know they came, you, you know, this is, they're not just first meeting with the public, you know, and so, but what the emails and what the subpoena document gave us an opportunity to see what the court documents, because they're ordered by the court to render those documents, it affirms what we already know. And, um, and I think that it's important that we continue to put that type of information out there via our data, uh, via our research, rather, to really discuss, uh, Ha, I told you, <laughs> here's empirical evidence that this is happening. And um, yeah, I can go on and on and give examples. We, you know, especially as an African-American, we talk about inequities all the time. And then when it's boom, it's on TV and you see someone kneeling on someone's neck and black people say, we, see, I've been trying to tell you, like, this is what's happening. And then now it's like, ha, ha, ha. And so, yeah. I stop there. <laughs> Sorry. Great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> On Zoom, we have Kyle Mott. Hey, Kyle. Hi there. Wonderful presentation. Oh, can we see Kyle? One second, actually. Okay. Try oh, one more time. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, wonderful presentation. I think that the topic is very important and salient. Uh, I have, I have, uh, it's kind of like a two part question. The first is that uh, I think that, I think that these students who are bringing this lawsuit are really exceptional. I'm thinking about when I was in high school and I did not care about civics at all. I remember acting out in my uh, like American history class so much. And so I'm wondering if, uh, well, first, is there a way to develop uh, more insight about like what are kids really wanting when it comes to their civic experience and how can we get them to want that? Uh, Cause you know, our civic system is broken in America. And the second thing is uh, it's one thing to know what the students want and it's to get them to want it. But the other part is what are those real foundational aspects of a civic education that will ensure um, our democracy can heal? You know, like you said, democracy right now is broken. So how can we, how can we, uh, what are the fundamental things we need to be considering as, as, as people bringing out um, 
the next generation? Uh, how can we ensure that democratic practices will be um, what they should be for democracy to be strong? Yeah, so I agree with you. I think the students are uh, exceptional. And even they were they were advocating for civics education. They got a really good hands-on experience <laughs> with this lawsuit, if I must say so myself. Uh, I think that what students are wanting, so it's twofold. We see here in America, particularly in our curriculum, that there's this emphasis on STEM. And yes, um, technology is like the future, yada, 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 all of that. Um, but I, I, I can't help but think critically in America's quest to be number one. In America's um, um, desire this, um, that's driven by capitalism, that we aren't using STEM as a way to ensure our future, you know, in, ter in, in terms of positioning. And I think that a lot of the policy, a lot of the money uh, behind STEM um, is more self serving than. <laughs> And when I say self serve as Americans, uh, then it is for the benefit of the student. So I say that. The next thing is, I think that our students are wanting an opportunity to have honest dialogue. We're, um, our students are among a generation where they are, they're fearless. Um, but also, they don't have the exposure that we had. And I think that in an attempt to kind of give a generation something that we didn't have, we forget to give them what we did have. And we had um, some, we had a lot of uh, training and uh, I was in mock trial. I went to, I went to a title one high school, but we still, we had a law magnet program in Savannah. And, oh, I'm a native of Savannah. I forgot to say that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, and we had, a, we had a courtroom in our high school and we went to state mock trial. Uh, I was, we were exposed to that. And so Kyle, I think our students are just wanting options. And, you know, when you read the case, you know, they want options outside of science, you know, technology, engineering and mathematics. And we all know in this room, not everybody ends up, you know, going that route. Um, when I was at, I had the honor of uh, directing a youth policy conference for the University of Missouri and the Missouri uh, Legislative Black Caucus Foundation. And I was their um, conference director for four years and it was called the Emerging Leaders Conference. And I would bring in student, 100 students from all across Missouri and they would spend um, three nights on campus but we did, um, we focus um, legislative, uh, we focus on legislative bills. Um, we prepared them for arguments on the floor. Um, it was, even though it was ran by the, uh, the, Dem the it was heavily run by the Democrats. Um, I ran the program. I wanted the program to be very bipartisan. I intentionally went out to rural Missouri because I wanted those students to have that exposure as well. And um, I, we would randomize which side they could take. So if they came in with a particular disposition, they may not be able to argue that side of the aisle. Because I wanted, because the, the, the beauty of debate is being able to see it from both sides and being able to argue both sides. And so I think that those are opportunities, Kyle, that our students uh, aren't getting all the time. And these were high school students, by the way, um, grades nine and 12. And it was hugely successful. And, um, and I think that our students care of, and they have opinions. And not only that, they're gonna be voters really soon. Many of our high school students, you know, are prepared to vote next year. So um, those are some of the things that, that our students are asking for. It's really, a Kyle, can I be honest with you? <laughs> it's the adults, Kyle. It's not the kids, it's the adults, it's the adults. And so it's up to the adults to, um, to really make provisions for these students and provisions, whether that be in our legislature to um, not necessarily require a civics assessment, but mandate, you know, um, a civics class or 
uh, mandate, uh, I don't know if they still do this, but when I was in high school, we had to, uh, we had to do five hours of community service every year, every year of high school, five hours. And so I don't know if that, but it was mandated. We could not graduate in Georgia without that. So I don't know if that's something that's mandated here. You know, so there are just some little things that I think that we can do. When I say we can have the adults, that some policies we can put in place to make sure that our students are getting the exposure and preparing them to be uh, engaged citizens. That's a great answer. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just curious how much of the, it, it sounds like, you know, we need federal change, like this needs to happen, but, but you mentioned like changing the constitution probably isn't realistic in the short term. So like, what do you, what do you think are, um, and I know this is probably outside of this, but we were talking beforehand about the importance of taking this research and getting it, you know, into policy and getting it to make change. What can you do at the local level, the state level, or is it going to require federal change? Like what will we'll actually level the playing field? Um, so I'm new to Ohio. I feel that there was an issue with your funding formula yeah. a few years ago. Well, <laughs> it was like he said always. Still. Still, right? There's an issue with the funding formula. Yeah. Can we start there? Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. just start something. Just yeah. start, just yeah. start there. Yeah. Um, making sure that uh, we are taking opportunities to engage both sides of the aisle. Um, I uh, politically, uh, I, I love being in the center um, because I think that the center is what we need. Um, when we live in a more polarized society, we really need harmony and peace. And so I'm hoping the center affords us that. <laughs> Uh, what are some ways we can pull some of your ideas, pull some of your ideas and put together for stronger democracy people? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if I can answer that fully, but I think that just starting with what we know, I don't think we need any new research. And I know I just probably talked myself out of the job. <laughs> like, what are you doing here? You don't make any research. But my point is, is that we have enough out, out there, you know, to have a, a, a playing field. And so I was thinking, um, Dr. Donna Ford in the Department of Ed Studies, she's an excellent scholar on gifted and talent education. We can't even start with her research, particularly in Michigan, until we can get qualified teachers in the building, you know? And so it's just the starting at the basic minimum. And I think that maybe there's this multi-tiered approach to uh, what our schools need and creating like this, I, this ideal structure of schools, maybe on like the pyramid type thing. Mm -hmm. There was a question online, yeah. Charity, is it Charity? Yeah, yeah it's Charity, thank you. Um, I have a question. So I'm a doctoral candidate at Glenn and my research area is education, policy and nonprofit and philanthropy. So all of the things that are creating our education environments. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of like the pro proliferation of autonomous schools and school choice and what that means for students and communities to be able to bring um, lawsuits that might have a larger impact. Um, and also all of this autonomy regarding uh, like curriculum and stuff and the um, priorities of certain schools and what, how this all like fits, I guess, into this conversation. I'm sure it makes it just that much more complicated, which is what I'm thinking in my mind, but. Yeah, I know. So, um, so in the in the Michigan case and the Gary Beach case, there were, I believe, either two or three charter schools that were uh, part of uh, the plaintiffs of that um, of that case. And because the state oversaw both traditional public schools as well as the charter schools there. So, um, so obviously, there there are some issues with our charter school system. So I probably have a very unpopular opinion when it comes to um, charter school and, and school choice. I think that we need a moratorium on charter school authorization. And um, I say that because um, conceptually, 
if all schools were created equal, we won't need a school choice. And uh, school choice is often touted to uh, families of color. Um, but if you go in, 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 in more wider districts, their schools are just good. They don't have school choice. So, um, so I do take issue with the whole school choice idea, uh, simply because I, I see that as an opportunity to, um, to leach additional funds from traditional uh, public schools. I think that they're, I think that everybody should be held accountable for how they spend their money, both traditional and charter schools. Um, but I think that if that is what is needed um, in terms of accountability of spending in order to put a moratorium on charter schools and uh, support our traditional public schools, then I think that that might be the route to go. But, um, but our charter schools, um, the ones that exist, and then you think about, the, and then I'm lumping them all together because you have some charter schools who are like community-based um, mom and pop charter schools, and they're really, really successful compared to, you know, your KIPs and your larger franchise uh, um, charter school um, charter school franchises. And so that's even an issue, Charity, that um, that we could probably discuss for another hour. Another hour, but I do think that uh, there needs to be a sense of um, the schools that exist that those students also need equitable uh, resources as well. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Wilson? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, this is Charlie Wilson. First name Charlie, last name Wilson, but don't ask me to <laughs> sing. I'm not an R&B singer. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. This was an excellent presentation, and I think you did a very good job, and you've done a very good job. And I'm saying that as one of those evil people you referred to earlier from Moritz. I'm a law professor at Moritz who's been teaching education law for the last 15 years. What oh I would, so I have a couple of suggestions that I think maybe for your next project or would improve yes. this project. I and I would, I would suggest that you, uh, are you hearing me okay? I'm getting horrible uh -huh. internet. Okay. I would suggest that you look at your project through the lens of Milliken against Bradley, uh, the United States Supreme Court in the early 70s that uh, stopped the efforts to integrate public schools across school district lines. And, uh, and yeah, you did a good job of dealing with the Rodriguez case, which uh, went after money uh, because Millic the Supreme Court had said students could not be moved from one school district to another district to receive a decent education. And so uh, the plaintiffs in that case just uh, argued that all students need was access to well-funded schools. And clearly the early goal of the school funding proponents was to guarantee equal funding for all schools or at least equal access uh, to funding. And clearly if that approach had succeeded, you wouldn't have this uh, research to be doing, and I think we'd all be happier, but that approach didn't succeed. And so, uh, but if it had succeeded, it would have tied all public schools together financially, uh, but we're not there. Uh, so where we are now is students from different racial and economic backgrounds uh, uh, are still attending different schools, uh, but had the Millican, or I'm sorry, had the Rodriguez approach worked, and had that been the way the funding advocates had gone, all parts, all parents and all legislators from cities and suburbs alike would have been, would have uh, certainly had some reason to care about the financial fate of all schools because they would all be drawing from a common pool of fund. But uh, the Supreme Court, as you did a very good, eloquent job of doing, said unequal funding of schools does not violate equal protection. So where I'm coming from is that local control of resources and local control and autonomy with respect to attendance boundaries protects the ability of wealthy suburban school districts to spend enormous resources on their own schools. So school finance litigators have basically moved to state courts with the focus on adequacy of funding, not on equality or equity. So it seems to me the lens you should be looking, uh, that I would suggest you at least consider looking at your project through is that we stop leaving suburban school districts untouched by uh, school uh, finance reform. 
just to, uh, and we stop uh, leaving them untouched by school desegregation. Instead, I think we need to take head on the autonomy and sanctity of uh, wealthy suburban uh, school districts. And if we don't confront that and challenge that, I think equity and education will always remain a pipe dream. So that's the lens I would uh, like for you to look at. And I would certainly appreciate your response. I know that was a lot of stuff there, but I think it gets back to the point that uh, the charity was talking about, about school choice, local autonomy, and uh, the, uh, the you know, uh, and uh, uh, the autonomy and sanctity of suburban uh, school districts. So I, I heartily embrace your desire, your skepticism about charter schools and vouchers, but as a suburban school board member myself, I'm a Worthington school board member, I would uh, like to see us take on directly this uh, sanctity and autonomy of uh, wealthy suburban school districts. Okay, and I think in the interest of time, um, I, I love that, Lance. Thank you so much for that suggestion, and I'm going to email you. <laughs> that will be fine, Wilson.49. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Dr. you. Thank um, you. And I'll just end by saying our next colloquium presentation will be from Dr. Carolina Reed, an associate professor at UC Berkeley's Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, the presentation will be virtual over Zoom. It'll be April 11th. So I hope you'll join us. And thank you, Kevin.